hello lovelies this is for aqa biology combined science paper one 2022 this is a very very specific video i've taken all of the bits from my whole topic video and sorted them out so in this video we're going to focus on the we're going to look at the major fixes of the exams we're going to look at the practicals which we know are going to come up in the exams and it is not going to include topics that we've been told by aqa that are not going to come up in the exam to go with this there is the workbook just for the 2022 exams as well this is a cut down version of my other workbooks so if you have my other workbooks you can still use those if you bought the bundle the workbooks are free in the bundle as well so um they are off my website this is the video just for this very specific exam if you were doing a different exam which is not aqa combined science biology paper one higher then go and check the description see if you can find the link to the video um, that you do want to do or go and watch the much longer whole topic video which covers everything um good luck lovelies um i know this year feels really really awful um but hopefully this video makes things a little bit easier for you DNA is a long strand of deoxyribonucleic acid made up of lots of letters A's, T's, C's and G's and these twist round into a double helix. This double helix is still ridiculously long so it further twists rounds so that it's in a chromosome and this chromosome is located in the nucleus of a cell. In mitosis we go from one parent cell to two identical daughter cells. The first thing that needs to happen is that the DNA in the nucleus needs to condense into chromosomes and then they need to line up down the middle. Once they're all lined up down the middle and all the checks are taken place to make sure that um, chromosomes aren't going to go astray, they can start to be pulled apart to either end of the cell. New nuclei will form and then they will separate into two identical daughter cells. Stem cells are fantastic things because they are things that have the potential to turn into any other type of cell. They have a number of different uses. For example, if you're treating Parkinson's disease, they can be used to grow new brain cells. If we're talking about brain or spinal injury, bone injuries, then they can be used to grow new bones to fill the gap. If we have organ failure, we can grow new organs or parts of organs instead of waiting and making someone wait on the incredibly long transplant waiting list. If we want to make stem cells, then we take a nuclei out of an egg cell. We take nuclei from the patient uh, cell and insert that into the empty egg. The egg can then start to develop into an embryo. From this embryo, the stem cell are then removed and stem cells are turned into new cells. This does come with quite a lot of controversy because human embryos are going to be created and then destroyed. And there are lots of religious objections to this. People just saying that life um, starts when embryos are created and people that object to the destruction of embryos. Here we have an overview of our digestive system. The mouth, which is mechanically going to break down food. The salivary gland, which is going to produce amylase. The liver, which produces bile. Bile is something that emulsifies fat, so increases the surface area of fats, turning them from a big blob into a small blob and neutralizes stomach acid. The gallbladder that stores bile. The small intestine that moves glucose, ions and other things into the blood and has a very large surface area. The stomach, which turns up food. The stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, kills bacteria and it provides an environment for proteases to work. Your pancreas, which produces enzymes. Your large intestine, which removes excess water. And your rectum and anus, which gets rid of waste food. There are a number of different enzymes in the digestive system that you need to be aware of. Lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids and glycerol. It is made in the pancreas and small intestine and works in the small intestine. Protease breaks down proteins into amino acids. It is made in the stomach, pancreas and small intestine and works in the stomach and small intestine. Amylase breaks down starch into sugars. It is made in the salivary glands, pancreas 
and small intestine and it works in the mouth and small intestine. Amylase, protease and lipase are all enzymes and work with the LEC and key mechanism. We have our enzyme which has a very specifically shaped active site. So only one substrate or a couple of substrates are going to fit in there, the ones that have the complementary site. They're going to form an enzyme substrate complex and then the enzyme is either going to break apart things or it is going to join together things. It is then going to release the products and then the enzyme is unchanged and can be used again. You need to know how and temperature affects enzyme activity and it is this kind of lopsided curve. When we have really, really low temperatures, there is not enough energy. At the peak, this is the optimal temperature. And then after the peak, the enzymes get denatured, which means the links between them holding everything together are being destroyed. The enzyme is not killed. I know the temptation is to say this, but the correct term is denatured. Our curve for pH is much more symmetrical. We still have an optimal pH, but when it is too high or too low, the bonds aren't going to be in place. So the active site of the enzyme is going to be broken down. So again, it's going to be denatured. Here we have our respiratory system. Air goes in through the mouth or the nose, down into the trachea, which is also known as the windpipe. Then into the bronchus, which is a branch of the trachea, into the bronchioli, which is a branch of the bronchus, and into the little grape or cauliflower shaped alveoli. This is where gas exchange happens. And they have an incredibly large surface area. Your diaphragm moves up and down to bring air in and out. The heart pumps blood around the body. The intercostal muscles allow the rib cage to expand. And the ribs, the last part that makes up everything, protects the lungs. Here we have a cardiovascular system and it is a double system. The blood gets pumped from the heart to the lungs, goes back to the heart and then gets pumped around the rest of the body. If you see a picture of the heart, the first thing you do is write right and left on there. We have our vena cava where the blood enters it goes into the right atrium down through a valve into the right ventricle from the right ventricle it goes up and to the lungs via the pulmonary artery it comes back into the heart via the pulmonary vein into the left atrium into the left ventricle and then is pumped to the rest of the body via the aorta if you want to check you have the path of blood right then we need to be looking at capital letters. It goes through the vena cava, the atrium, the ventricle, then the artery, back through the vein, into the atrium, to the ventricle, and then the aorta. So it goes vena cava, atrium, ventricle, artery, vein, atrium, ventricle, aorta. V-A-V-A-V-A. -A -A. If you don't have that pattern, you've made a mistake somewhere. Other features of the heart that you need to know are here. These are valves. They will only allow blood to flow. And that this side has a much larger muscle than this side. The right side only needs to pump blood to the lungs, which aren't very far away. But this side has to pump blood to the rest of the body a much longer distance. The majority of the time, veins carry deoxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries oxygenated blood back into the heart. And the majority of the time, um, arteries carry oxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. If the heart isn't functioning properly, pacemakers, artificial pacemakers, can be introduced to help the heart keep time. Or if somebody has cardiovascular disease, then these tubes can get blocked up. Arteries have a very thick walls because they are carrying blood under high pressure, which means they have a thin lumen. That's the gap in the middle. Capillaries are very, very small. They are only one cell thick or very, very thin, I should say. They're only one cell thick. This is to allow for diffusion. They generally go around in this kind of like mesh network around things like the guts, around the villi in the gut, around the alveoli in the lungs, so they have a large surface area. The veins carry deoxygenated blood, they carry it back to the heart, so they have valves, and they have thin walls and a thick lumen because they're carrying blood under low pressure. Blood is made up of several components. The actual colour of blood is this pale yellow colour. This is the serum, that's the liquid component of the blood. The cells give it its actual colour. Red blood cells, the cells that give blood its colour, have no nuclei, and this is so they have more space to carry oxygen, 
which is their main function. White blood cells are part of the immune system and platelets are fragments of cells and they are important for things like clotting. When we have cardiovascular disease, we have fatty deposits building up in the coronary arteries, the arteries around the heart. This can lead to the formation of blood clots. This blood clot can block an artery. This is going to restrict the oxygen to some cells. These cells are then going to die. If too many cells die, this can then lead to a heart attack. If so many cells die that the heart can't function properly or can't pump blood properly. Risk factors for this are going to be smoking, high blood pressure or having too much salt or fat in your diet. Health is a complicated concept. It is going to be your overall state of physical and mental well-being. This is going to be affected by a number of things. It is going to be affected by your diet, exercise, community, whether you feel lonely, whether you have friends, and in part by your genes. Epidemiology studies are going to be looking at the levels of health and illness in a population. We need to do it in a wide population so we can look for different risk factors. For example, we can't force people, we can't ask people to eat a high fat diet or to do lots of exercise or to drink lots so we can compare them to other people who don't do those things or do do those things. But there are people within a wide population that do do those things already. So if we wanted to look at the effect of exercise on health, we could take our population, we could look at people that do lots of exercise and compare them to people that didn't do any exercise. And because we have such a large population of people we're looking at, then we can compare the two groups. And we can follow these groups for years and years to see what the effects are going to be. Cancer is when cells begin to divide uncontrollably. This is going to lead to lumps, which for most people, some people, is the first sign that something is wrong. And these lumps can be divided into two groups, benign tumours and malignant tumours. Benign tumours are slow and are generally harmless. Things like warts or moles are benign tumours. And having a lump on your skin generally doesn't do you much damage. The problem is when there are malignant tumours. These are fast growing, they are aggressive and they are mobile. So I don't mean the water on your arm or the mole on your arm is going to get up and start moving around. I mean cells are going to move throughout your body. Cells from the initial lump are going to jump into the bloodstream, move somewhere else and they could set up tumours, lumps in other places. And while a lump on your skin generally won't do you much damage, a lump in your brain, a lump in your liver or a lump in your lungs can do you quite a lot of damage. There are also risk factors involved in cancer and there are a lot of things that we're in control of. Smoking has large implications in lung cancer. Diet, a good diet, can reduce your risk of bowel cancer, whereas if you don't eat much fruit and vegetables then you are putting your bowel um, at risk of cancer. The amount of time you spend in the sun can affect your susceptibility to skin cancer and unprotected sex can leave you at risk of cervical cancer. Photosynthesis is going to take water, carbon dioxide, and turn it into oxygen and glucose. We can take light and we can put it above the equation but do not put it in the equation because it is not a reactant. It's just a condition that's needed. You also need to know the symbols for these. So water is H2O plus carbon dioxide, which is CO2, goes to oxygen, O2 plus glucose, which is C6H12O6. This needs to be balanced, but it's a nice easy one to balance because it is 666. So you can just remember that it's 666. And when you're writing out your formula, make sure your numbers are little and are in the correct place. Because if you write this, that's wrong, that's wrong, and you will lose the marks. In photosynthesis, we are taking energy from here, taking energy from light, and we are locking it up in glucose. This is an endothermic reaction. It takes in energy. There are certain requirements for photosynthesis. First of all, we are going to need chlorophyll. That is our green pigment in leaves. We're going to need water and carbon dioxide because they are our reactants and then we're going to need sunlight. And the levels of these can greatly affect how much photosynthesis takes place. The rate of photosynthesis is going to depend on the percentage level of carbon dioxide. As the percentage level of carbon dioxide increases, so the rate of photosynthesis is going to increase, but only up to a point. 
After this point, there are going to be other limiting factors. Past this point, we need to increase something like the water, light, or the temperature if we want more photosynthesis to take place. We could easily switch this out to the percentage level of water and the graph would look the same. Light intensity is important for the rate of photosynthesis. When it is nighttime, when it is dark, we do not have lots of photosynthesis going on. As we get further through the day, as we get more light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis will increase until we get to a point where it is no longer the limiting factor and other things like the reactants or temperature need to be increased. After this point, we need to think about increasing other things. Now, even though the graph is flat here, it looks like it might have stopped. It hasn't. There is still a steady rate of photosynthesis. It's just not increasing as much as it was down here. It's just a steady rate. When plants are very, very cold, everything acts very, very slowly. Not a lot happens. It slowly increases until a nice point where the enzymes are happy and there's lots and lots of photosynthesis going on until it gets too hot and they start to be denatured and then the rate will fall off very rapidly. So we have our rate of reaction increasing the temperature and our optimal temperature and our enzymes getting denatured. It's really important that you remember that the enzymes are denatured, they are not killed their denatured. The actual um, rate of photosynthesis that takes place is much more complicated than depending on just one thing. It's going to depend on lots of different things all at once. The glucose from photosynthesis is going to be stored as starch. The most obvious example of starch There are a number of factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis and we can look at this in a practical. We can measure the release of oxygen that is coming out of the photosynthesis equation. We can measure the number of bubbles coming out. And there are two ways that we can do this. We can simply count the number of bubbles or we can be a bit more sophisticated and we can use a measuring cylinder to measure the volume of bubbles that are coming out. You can change various things in this practical. You can change the light intensity by changing the distance of the lamp from the pondweed or algal balls, whatever it is you're using. Or you can change the colour of the light or... You can change the concentration of carbon dioxide that is used in the water. You need to be able to know about the different factors that affect the rate of synthesis and be able to recognise and draw the graphs of them. So starting off with light intensity. As we increase the light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis will increase, but only up to a point. After a point, something else will become the limiting factor. That could be carbon dioxide concentration. As we increase the concentration of carbon dioxide that is available, then we are going to get an increase in the rate of photosynthesis, but again, only up to a point. Temperature will also affect the rate of photosynthesis. The rate will increase as temperature increases, but only up to a certain point. After a certain point, the temperature will be too high and the proteins involved in photosynthesis will start to denature. with a cell membrane that's responsible for determining which bits go in and out of the cell. A cell wall, important for structure. The vacuole, important for structure. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The tiny little dots are the ribosomes, which are responsible for protein synthesis. The green bits are the chloroplasts. The pink ones are the mitochondria, where um, energy is produced. And then last but not least, we have our 
nucleus. Here we have our animal cell with our cell membrane, again controlling what goes in and out our mitochondria, where energy is produced, ribosomes, which are responsible for protein synthesis, cytoplasm where most of the reactions take place, and our nucleus where is the, that's where the DNA is held and that's the control centre of the cell. You'll notice there are several features of a plant cell that an animal cell doesn't share. For example, the cell wall, the vacuole, the chloroplasts. If you want to copy these pictures yourself, you can download them in the free version guide from my website. Here we have our bacterial cell, which has its cell membrane, controlling what goes in and out. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The chromosome, the DNA, not in a nucleus. The flagella, which is used for um, locomotion. Ribosomes, for protein synthesis and then on the outside we have the cell wall. Even though you have to learn the structure of a typical plant cell or a typical animal cell, there isn't really a typical type of cell because there are a wide range of differentiated specialised cells. We can see here in our cross section of the leaf it has lots of different types of cells in. Here we have a neuron which looks very different to a muscle cell which is going to look very different to a skin cell or very different to a set of cells in the gut. They're going to be specialised to do their jobs. So here here we have villi, which give us long surface area. Here the cells are very tall to provide structure. Here the cells have a very long body so that the neurons can travel a long distance. And the muscle cells are going to stretch and contract. All cells start off looking the same. So they have your basic cell structure. And then various different genes will be turned on and turned off. And that's when it will start to specialise. That's when differentiation will take place and it will grow this really, really long axon or it will grow the villi or it will turn into a leaf cell. You need to know the difference between a tissue, an organ and an organ system. A tissue is one type of cell carrying out one function. An organ is made up from lots of different types of cells carrying out a joint function. And an organ system are a group of organs that work together to carry out a function. So our hierarchy is cells, tissues, organs, organ systems. For example, we can have muscle cells, which are part of muscle tissue, which together control tract which form part of the stomach churning food and this forms part of the digestive system. A pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease. For example, we can have viruses, bacteria, fungi or protists. And these can be spread in a number of different ways. They can be spread in the air, for example, by coughing. They can be spread by touch. Uh, for example, if you have bacteria on your hands or you have bacteria or virus on your hands and you touch a table and someone else then touches that same table. They can be spread through blood. Uh, sexual fluids, or they can be transferred via a vector like via a mosquito. Bacteria are going to make you feel ill because they produce a lot of toxins, so they'll give you things like food poisoning. Viruses will make you feel ill because when they reproduce, they cause massive cell death. Salmonella is caused by a bacteria. It's spread by eating infected foods. It lives in the gut of farm animals, so infected foods are going to be like things like um, eggs, meat, milk or poultry. However, it's very, very rare in the UK. We have eggs that have a little lion mark on them, which means they are salmonella free. And I don't think there's been a case of salmonella poisoning from eggs in years. The implications are going to be diarrhea, stomach cramps, vomiting and fever. Not very pleasant at all. And if severe dehydration sets in, then it can be life-threatening. Gonorrhea is a bacteria, which has a very long complicated name. It is spread via contact with penile or vaginal fluid. It can also be passed to a from a mother to a newborn baby. The implications are a thick, green, smelly discharge from the penis or vagina, thoroughly unpleasant, pain and urinating and bleeding. While the um, symptoms are thoroughly unpleasant, about one in 10 infected men and around half of infected women won't actually show any symptoms. Because the symptoms are so unpleasant and because quite a large number of people don't actually show any symptoms, it is very, very important that you always wear a condom. Apart from being smelly and off-putting, uh, the main damage here is going to be to your reputation, apart from if you're a newborn baby, wherein it can lead to blindness. I imagine most of you have been vaccinated or if you haven't, at least you've heard about vaccinations. Vaccinations are given generally to children or people that have gone on holiday to different places. And the childhood vaccination programme in the UK has prevented millions and millions of deaths 
and further millions and millions of serious illnesses. And in this country, it has wiped out a large number of debilitating diseases. It is very rare to hear anyone getting polio these days in the UK because we are all vaccinated against it at a young age. The polio vaccine isn't too bad because they give it to you on a sugar cube, but it is quite painful taking your eight-week-old baby to be injected by the nurse. A vaccination is going to contain small amounts of dead or inactive pathogens. This allows your immune system to develop antibodies. So if you get infected with the disease at a later point, your body already has antibodies to it, it can recognise it, it knows its pathogen, it knows how to deal with and it can be dealt with quickly before you get ill. The advantages are that a large number of diseases have been wiped out, for example, nobody gets smallpox anymore or polio. And we have herd immunity, which means if a large percentage of the population are vaccinated against a disease, even the small percentage that have decided to not be vaccinated or can't be vaccinated for medical reasons are going to be protected as well because the disease will find it very hard to spread. The disadvantages is that they don't always work. The polio um, vaccines, smallpox vaccines, are very, very efficient, but things like the flu vaccine doesn't always work and it can be painful and there can be side effects. You may have heard about um, a controversy where somebody linked the MMR vaccine and autism. This is completely untrue. There is absolutely no link between these two. Because bacteria divide so quickly, in good conditions, they can divide once every 20 minutes they are going to be very, very susceptible to mutations in their DNA. Completely random changes, which means completely randomly, one tiny bacteria could develop a resistance to an antibiotic. And it only needs one bacteria out of a large collection to become resistant to the antibiotic for it to become a problem. Here we can see an antibiotic sensitivity test. These are the discs with antibiotics on it, and you can see the bacteria is growing all the way up to these discs, but not all the way up to this disc here. So the role of antibiotics is to kill bacteria. Because the bacteria divide so quickly, mutations can quickly develop. If to course of any antibiotics, any non-resistant bacteria will be killed off and any resistant bacteria will survive and grow. This is natural selection in action and soon only resistant bacteria will be left. This is a problem because we are running out of antibiotics to treat um, common complications with. For example, um, tonsillitis um, is easily treated these days. Small infections are easily treated these days, whereas previously they might have been lethal. We use antibiotics far too much. They are given to animals um, daily, habitually in their feed. And this is driving the natural selection, driving the bacteria to mutate. New drugs need to be tested for new things, toxicity, efficacy and dose. Toxicity tells us the level or the amount of the drug that we can take before the side effects are too bad. All the drugs that we take on a daily basis have side effects, but since we know how toxic they are, we know which safe or reasonable level we can take them at without suffering too badly from the side effects. Efficacy is like how efficient it is. You can see the similarities in the two words. Does it work better or worse than what's already on the market? Are the side effects better or worse than what's already on the market? Is it worth developing or taking this drug? And dose, how much do you need to take for the drug to be effective? Penicillin has saved millions and millions of lives. It's potentially saved your life and you probably haven't even realised. When um, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in uh, 1928, it really was revolutionary because before that, people were dying of things that now we take for granted. If you've ever been in hospital and had an operation, you've probably been given antibiotics afterwards to stop you getting an infection. Or if you've ever had tonsillitis, you've probably been given penicillin. And it cleared up any infection without many complications. But before we had penicillin, people died of operations, people died of common things all the time. But this was an accidental discovery. He went away, left his bacterial plates and some of them went mouldy. And he noticed that the bacteria didn't grow all the way up to the mould. Something in the mould was stopping the growth of the bacteria. And this is when we realised it was penicillin and that penicillin could stop bacterial growth. And the discovery of aspirin is down to a traditional ancient medicine. It's been known for ages that people used to chew on willows, willow bark, when they had a headache, when they had a toothache, when they weren't feeling very well. 
So the willow, the willow bark was taken, it was distilled and it was discovered that it had aspirin in it and that's how we got our major painkiller. These beautiful, beautiful flowers are foxgloves but they are highly, highly toxic because from these flowers we get digitalis which is a heart drug. Saved millions of lives but the flowers have probably killed hundreds of children. You may have seen plants in the summer covered with thousands, millions of tiny little black or green aphids devouring the plant as they go. They will go, they will suck all of the, the water, all the nutrients, all of the ions out of the plant, effectively killing it. However, the good news is that ladybirds and ants love to eat aphids, so this is a way that we can have natural pest control. You can go on the internet and you can order a box of ladybirds and you can use these to control the aphids in your garden. For respiration, we are going to take glucose, add it to oxygen and come out with water and carbon dioxide. Side. You need to know the symbols for these, so oxygen is O2, water H2O, carbon dioxide CO2 and glucose C6H12O6. This needs to be balanced but it's a nice easy one, 666. Six, six. You have to make sure your numbers are the right size and in the right place, so these ones need to be little numbers and these ones need to be big numbers. Respiration is an exothermic reaction which means energy is given out. The best example we can see of respiration is screaming jelly baby demo where we take potassium chlorate that's our liquid oxygen add in our glucose that's our jelly baby and you can see the massive amount of energy that comes off it. Anaerobic means without oxygen. So for anaerobic respiration we take glucose and we turn it into energy and lactic acid. Not as much energy as aerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration can also take place in yeast. So yeast will take the glucose and will convert it into carbon dioxide and ethanol. Ethanol is used in drinks and cleaning products and carbon dioxide is used for a variety of things. But when we're talking about uh, in context of yeast, that is what's going to make your cakes or your bread rise. Metabolism is the rate that chemical reactions take place in your body. For example, glucose being turned into starch, cellulose or glycogen, fatty acids and glycerol being turned into lipids, amino acids being made into proteins, glucose and nitrite ions forming amino acids, proteins breaking down to form urea, and all of this is going to involve energy. The energy is going to come from respiration involving glucose, that's going to take place in the mitochondria of our cells. Amino acids, they're important for building proteins, proteins make up all of our hormones, all of our enzymes, these are the bits that actually carry out all of the reactions within our body. Lipids are important for maintaining um, our cell structure and for storing energy. 